Hi, I'm Robin from Leica. I'm here at the Leica HQ, Lights Park in Wetzlar, and I'm here to introduce you to the Leica SL2. Now this is of course the successor to the original SL, a camera that was launched in 2015 and there have been some monumental upgrades to the camera and as well as those upgrades there's also been several new features added to the camera. So I'm going to be running you through all those changes. I'll start by talking about some of the external differences to the camera and some of the ergonomic changes to the camera. Now having spoken to the design team, I know that they very much wanted to respect the original SL. Why wouldn't they? It was a beautiful camera. But they wanted to give it a bit more of a character, a bit more of a, a Leica iconic look. So in order to do so, they've looked back at some of the iconic historical designs, cameras such as the R3, the R4, the Leica Flex SL series camera. And they've been in particular drawn to the three-part design of those cameras, that being the top plate, the bottom plate and that kind of prism lens mount area. So that's been achieved on this camera by adding this rather attractive leatherette that runs around the camera. Um, it looks nice, but it also has um, practical um, use in that it's very grippy in the hand. It feels much more stable to hold. And talking about the handling of the camera, there's been something which I added, something that I absolutely love, and that's this recess in the hand grip. And inside that recess, there's an elastomer material, which is a synthetic rubber material, and it is extremely grippy. So if you're holding the camera with one hand, whether in that kind of landscape or portrait position, it's just going to feel much more stable in the hand. So if you're using it for those longer periods of time, it's just going to be more comfortable to use. Um, the camera is made from the finest materials. I'm sure you'd expect that from Leica. There's certainly been no compromise there. The top plate and the bottom plate are milled from solid pieces of aluminium and those pieces are then anodized to give it this beautiful finish. The remainder of the body is actually a new material in this camera. They're using um, die cast magnesium. And the result of those materials is that you have something that feels really great in the hands it's robust, it's strong. So yeah, there's been some fantastic improvements overall. There's also been some very good upgrades in terms of the ceiling of the camera. It actually has an official IP54 rating, which basically means it's ready for very harsh conditions. It can take water spray from any given angle. It can operate in temperatures down to minus 10 degrees and all the way up to 40 degrees for those hotter climates. And there's basically not an environment you're not going to be able to use this camera in. So that's fantastic news on that front. So there is also a new um, button layout of the camera. If I turn it around, you're going to see these three buttons down the left hand side of the screen. This is of course different to the original SL which had a four button layout. Now, from my experience, I found this actually a lot easier to use. It's a much clearer from the beginning. And if you're familiar with the M10 or the Q2 or the Leica CL, this is already gonna be very familiar with you um, because those cameras also feature this three button design. And I think that is the key point here. Leica wanted there to be more of a, um, a natural progression between the systems. So if you pick up the Leica Q2 and then you move to the SL2, you're not gonna be stuck trying to find where your controls are. It's gonna be very instinctive, very intuitive to use. Now, if I tap into the menu, turn on the camera, wake it up, you're gonna be welcomed with these icons and these are icons that access some of the most important features of the camera, which is great, that means less time going through the menu. So let's just say, for example, I wanna change my focus point, tap here, I can use the touch screen to scroll through those options like so. It's very easy. And if I was wearing gloves or I had, let's say, wet hands, for example, I can also make use of the scroll wheel or the joystick to navigate through those options. So it's very simple, very easy to use. You may also have noticed that photo is currently highlighted in white and video is currently grayed out. This is something that I absolutely love about the camera. You can toggle very easily between photo stills photography and if I click onto video here, you're gonna see a white rectangle illuminate with all your video settings highlighted. Also, the icons below have changed because these icons are only relevant to your video settings. If I move into the menu, the menu pages are now only relevant 
to video settings. Um, let's go back into the menu, back to photo settings. Again, these icons are now only relevant to photo settings and into the menu, the menu pages are only relevant to photo. It sounds so simple, so I wonder why nobody's done it before. This is, for, from my perspective, the best user interface that's ever been implemented on a camera. It really couldn't be easier to use. Now, the viewfinder of this camera has also undergone an upgrade. It's now been increased to a higher resolution. It is 5.76 megapixels. The original SL was 4.4 megapixels, so that's a really good upgrade there. It still has the lovely medium format magnification. It's a 0.78 magnification, so the overall experience is truly immersive. There is also the option to change the refresh rate of the viewfinder. It has a standard 60 frames per second, but via the menu that can be up to 120 frames per second. That is of course advantageous if you're making kind of quick sweeping movements with the camera. The result will be nice and stable, nice and crisp, clear information through the viewfinder. Um, there is this diopter at the back of the at the top of the viewfinder sorry and you can turn that diopter there are nice positive clicks there once it's locked in place it's not going to accidentally move um, and it's also been crafted from the finest materials there is only metal and glass inside this viewfinder so overall result is is genuinely something quite special and it's really a joy to use There is of course a brand new sensor in the camera. It has now been upgraded to a 47.3 megapixel CMOS sensor. That's a big upgrade over the previous camera which had a 24 megapixel sensor. Um, the ISO range remains the same. It's 50 all the way up to 50,000. And there is the addition of a new processor in the camera. So Leica are putting in for the first time their Maestro 3 processor, which is more than capable um, dealing with those large files the camera now produces. There is the focal plane shutter in the camera, which has a range all the way down to 30 minutes for those nice long exposures, and that can go up to 8,000th of a second. But if you require quicker shutter speeds, you can then activate the electronic shutter in the camera, which starts at one second, but will take you all the way up to a staggering 40,000th of a second. So if you enjoy using your wide apertures in bright sunny conditions, this is of course going to be a big advantage for you without the need for stacking ND filters on front of the lens. Um, it's a very speedy camera, it's speedier than the previous camera. You can now fire off up to 20 frames per second, again using the electronic shutter. Um, so you're not going to be lost for speed with this camera. And there is an increase in the buffer size. You now have a four gig buffer, which will allow you to shoot up to 78 consecutive DNG files or 100 JPEGs. So relevant to the sensor, there's um, another feature which is certainly gonna excite a lot of people out there. This camera now features a five axis in-body image stabilizer. Now, in practical terms, that is going to give you huge benefits for those slow shutter speeds when you're, you know, you're shooting down to the quarters or half second kind of territory. So to give you a practical example, if you're shooting a telephoto shot at say 200 millimeter and your shutter speed is 200th of a second, with the image stabilizer kicked in, that's actually going to allow you to come down all the way to a third of a second. Um, so the, the stabilizer is giving you 5.5 stops there. So that's something quite remarkable. And this is also going to be um, beneficial, not just for use with your SL lenses, of course, with the correct adapter, um, whether you're using M lenses or R lenses, this is going to be the first time with a Leica camera that you can use stabilizer with those lenses. So again, something to be excited about. So we've already touched on video um, to a small degree in the fact that it's very easy to navigate between stills photography and video functionality. Um, so let's talk about some of the spec now. There's been some vast improvements there too. You now have the ability to shoot up to um, 5K in 30 frames per second. In 4K, you have the option of 60 frames per second or 30 frames per second. 
on the original SL to get the best, to kind of extract the best footage from the camera, you would have to actually connect an external recorder. So to shoot 4K 30 frames a second in 422, that's 10 bit footage, you would have to connect that device. With the SL2, there's actually no need for that. You can record 4K 30 frames a second, 422, that's 10 bit footage, directly to the SD card inside the camera. So that's extremely advantageous. Another video feature is the possibility to turn the camera into cine mode. Now, what does that mean? There are different terminologies that cinematographers use. So photographers, of course, are used to apertures, shutter speeds and ISOs, while cinematographers talk in shutter angles, T-stops and ASA. So that is going to be something that I think all cinematographers will appreciate when they're shooting their video footage on this camera. There is the addition now of um, 3.5 um, ports on the camera, so for audio in, audio out. On the previous camera, you would have to actually use um, a separate accessory to access those ports. Um, there's still, of course, the HDMI output here, and there is now the addition of USB-C. Now, this is extremely advantageous because this allows you to connect to um, an external power supply. So if you're shooting video, which we know is very power hungry on the batteries, this is going to allow you to record for longer. Um, and if the camera is actually switched off, that will actually charge up the batteries inside your camera. Um, further to that, I guess if you're shooting in a studio environment, doing those longer shooting sessions, that's also going to be an advantage there. So the SL2 has an entirely upgraded autofocus system. It's called Leica Object Detection Autofocus. And this is a contrast-based system with depth mapping technology included as well. And there's also the introduction of IAF. That is an intelligent autofocus which sits alongside AFS and AFC. And what that's doing is basically making the decision for the user. It's, it's able to switch between AFS and AFC and it will make the decision on what is most relevant for what you're photographing at that time. There are of course the, the usual AF modes which we've seen in the original SS, SL. We have multi-field which makes use of the 225 fields. We have spot, we have field zone and tracking and there is now the inclusion of something new called face and body detection. Before I explain face and body detection I'll just um, point out that with your field setting you can actually increase the size of that field. Um, so face and body detection this is something which I've never used before um, and now having used it I don't see how I could be without it it's incredibly good. Everybody is probably familiar now with face detection. It's something which is very common. It even appears on smartphones. Um, and the problem, of course, with face detection is as soon as that person looks away from the camera, goes a bit more profile, this is where face detection begins to struggle or not work, not function. So this is where the body detection will kick in and you'll see basically a white rect vertical rectangle appear in your frame and that's going to start following the body in your frame. If you have multiple bodies, you will see multiple rectangles in the frame and you have the ability with either using the touch screen or using the joystick on the back of the camera to switch between which body you want to track. And if that person then turns back, you'll see the face detection automatically kick back in. So it's using both technologies together. Further to that, there are now four AF profiles on the camera and these are all geared towards different types of movement that you might be photographing and they've been broken down into children and pets, runner, team sports and wildlife. Of course you can photograph a lot more than that but you just need to make a decision on which, which profile is going to be best suited for what you are indeed photographing. Um, now, you can even go a step beyond that. You can actually break down each of these four categories um, and customize them. You have three different areas for customization. These areas are depth sensitivity, field movement, and shift in direction. So let's try and explain what those three things are. So starting with depth sensitivity. 
This is perhaps when you're AF tracking um, your subject and perhaps an object may appear inside your frame or your subject may suddenly be hidden by something which appears in the frame. I could take the example of photographing an animal and you're panning around and then suddenly there's a tree that appears in the foreground. If you have your depth sensitivity set to a minus setting, then the focus is not suddenly going to shift onto the tree as you pan around. It's basically going to wait for a period of time until you come around or the animal suddenly reappears and the focus will still be locked on the animal. If you had it set on a more responsive setting, one of those plus, plus two setting for example, then the focus will suddenly shift to the tree and you've therefore lost the focus on the animal. Next setting is your field movement. Now this is when you may have multiple movements happening in your frame. So let's take the example of photographing um, a football game. Your focus may be locked on, let's say the player with the ball, but suddenly that player runs off the frame. If you have your field movement set on an unresponsive setting, then that field again is going to wait for a period of time, almost anticipating, you know, waiting for the player to come back. And as soon as it does, it's going to be locked in on the original same position. If you had it set to a plus side, a more responsive setting, then what's going to happen is the, um, the AF is going to pick up on a similar movement happening in the frame, and therefore you've lost the original position. Finally, we have shift in direction. Now this is all about tracking those really unpredictable movements which may be occurring. So a good example would be trying to photograph wildlife. Um, so if we um, take the example of a bird, we know they make these very quick, unpredictable movements. So this would be a setting where you would tweak up to the plus side. There isn't actually a minus setting in this. You, you start off from zero and you move up to plus two. So plus two would be good for those very unpredictable movements while the zero setting is more suited to those kind of constant um, speed motions that are like a, a subject that's moving at a constant speed. So we've heard all the, um, the technical talk behind it, now let's actually give it a try. We'll be heading outside and we're putting, putting the camera through its paces to see how it keeps up with different types of movement.